Our speaker today is our very own Samuel Barrett, who joined our department in uh, January to work on the project funded by HSC, about the vessels, uh, for two years. Uh, but his talk today is not about possessors at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the kind of project marking, which is all, it was the main topic of the dissertation and also the topic of the forthcoming book. Thank you. Um, the specific topic is about languages which have differential object marking and in which the exponent of differential object marking is homophonous with dative case. Um, and um, so we find this in a number of languages, for example, in uh, Spanish, which is on the first page of your handout in examples one and two, um, where in 1a we have a transitive clause with a definite direct object, yo veo el libro, I see the book, um, just subject, verb, object, nothing special going on there. But in 1b, when the direct object is animate, um, we get this, this differential object marking element. So we have yo veo a la mujer, I see the woman, and we have this a appearing here. Um, in 1c, we have a ditransitive construction in which the, the direct object does not get differential marking, but there is a recipient argument, and we see that this uh, recipient argument is introduced by an element which is homophonous with, with what is glossed as differential object marking in 1b. So we have, yo doy el libro a la mujer, I give the book to the woman. Um, so that's the basic phenomenon. We have, we have this element a, which can appear with what, is, what are usually called direct objects and, what, and indirect objects or recipients. Uh, two shows an example, um, another ditransitive with the, with the verb uh, return now, um, which shows that if we have an, an inanimate recipient <laughs> or goal <laughs> argument, um, like, uh, like library, as in two, Hugo devolvió los libros a la biblioteca, we still get this a marker, even though we have an inanimate argument now. So there are some differences in... Um, so basically, direct objects have differential marking, that's what the name says, but indirect objects are introduced by this A in Spanish in general. Um, Spanish is not at all the only language which does something like this, though the, most of the data I'll be talking about will be from Spanish, um, European Spanish, um, but I'll, other languages that have something similar are Hindi, um, Kashmiri, um, Basque, at least some varieties of Basque as well, most of most Romans languages with, which have differential object marking show something uh, show this kind of homophony, um, but it's also found in, in some other languages outside of the Indo-European family. And the way that I want to approach this question is, um, or I want to ask the question where this where this homophony comes from. And what I'll try and do is sort of have think about two extreme hypotheses. One is that that the homophony comes uh, is because of syntax, meaning that when we have this a ah in Spanish on both direct objects and indirect objects, this is because um, so this the hypothesis could be that this is because they express the same grammatical relation. So whatever object is in that grammatical relation is spelled out with a. Ah. Um, on this view, we would, we would explain the homophony just by saying that, yeah, these are syntactically the, the same kind of syntactic object, and that's why they get the same spell out. Um, this is what some people have suggested, and in, in particular for Spanish, but the logic, or like um, romance in Spanish, but the logic sort of is supposed to hold for other languages as well. Um, if this is true, then we would expect that, if, so if we're looking at one grammatical relation, we would expect um, objects with differential object marking, and indirect objects to behave alike in syntax. Um, so that's one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is that the homophony is just simply due to morphology. These languages happen to have um, this differential object case marker, which just accidentally is syncretic with dative case, basically. So nothing in syntax tells us that these th two things should be identical, but they come out as identical in um, in morphology. So the idea here is that we're dealing with two distinct grammatical relations, like we're used to from languages which don't have this homophony, say a direct object and an indirect object, but these are spelled out in the same way. On this hypothesis, um, we don't necessarily expect these two kinds of objects to form a natural class in syntax because we're looking at two distinct grammatical relations. And what I'm doing in this talk is to apply a couple of tests to structures involving both and see whether direct objects with or without differential marking and indirect objects pattern together or differently. So that's the basic idea. We'll look, at, um, we'll look a tiny bit at uh, some different object positions in the clause. We'll look at how these arguments relate to uh, 
passivization, reduced relative formation, controlling secondary predicates, um, nominalizations, and some other um, aspects. So the basic claims that I'm trying to, or that I want to make, are that in Spanish, Hindi, um, Kashmiri, um, Basque, and probably some other languages, um, zero-coded direct objects and objects with differential object marking form a natural class. They are both direct objects um, and should be analyzed as that, and they are distinct from indirect objects. Um, and, and towards the end, I'm not sure whether there's any handouts left. Um, uh, yeah. um, and towards the end of this talk, I'll, I'll um, contrast the, the Spanish, Hindi, etc. data with uh, data from uh, English and Hanti, which allow a kind of argument structure alternation in certain verbs, which I think um, provides some more evidence that we're looking at sort of there's different ways of, of grouping grammatical relations, basically. Okay, um, if we turn the page, we can start um, with uh, syntactic tests. So the first thing in 2.1 that I want to talk about is just very briefly about object positions. Um, Luis Lopez, in his book on differential object marking in Spanish and some other languages, um, discusses some evidence for, for a structurally, structurally lower and a structurally higher object position. Um, so in example three, he provides a certain context. It's about enemies and, and taking hostages and so on. And so he says that there's a context. What did the enemies do? The enemies delivered X to Y and Z to W, but los enemigos no entregaron a su hijo a ningún prisionero. So the enemies did not deliver any prisoner to his son. Now, he points out that in this sentence, you can either have the A, so you can have differential object marking um, any, on any prisoner, or you can not have differential object marking on, on that object. Both sentences are fine. But only when you have differential object marking can the direct object bind the possessive pronoun in the recipient. So, so that, would be, that would give us the meaning that um, uh, the enemies did not deliver any prisoner to that prisoner's son. So he suggests that, that that reading is only possible when we have differential object marking, which suggests that the object with differential object marking is structurally more prominent because it can bind the possessor, even though this is not, not reflected in the word order in, in example three. Um, Hindi is another language which shows different object, position, uh, object positions in connection with uh, differential object marking. We see this in 4a and b. Uh, we have a ditransitive with, a, uh, with the verb send. So we can have um, the word order ram to Anita a letter sent, um, in which the direct object letter is, is, doesn't have um, overt case marking. But we can also have 4b, where we have ram, the letter, ko, um, Anita to send. So we have, again, we have the homophonous um, ko on both the direct object and an indirect object in this language, and we get this different object position. So one could say, OK, so maybe the, maybe the spell out of this homophonous element comes, comes about because of a structurally high position in the clause. So whenever you have a direct object that is in a higher position than its, than its base position, basically, maybe that's where you spell out the same, uh, an element in the same way as the indirect object. And this seems to be what's happening in Spanish and Hindi, but um, this is no means, these are not by no means the only languages which do this kind of thing. So, Loads of other languages have um, loads of other languages have have distinct positions for objects, um, independently of whether they have differential object marking or not, and independently of whether this differential object marking is homophonous with dative. So, in five A B C D, I just have a couple of examples from uh, from Canada, which has uh, differential marking as well, as well as distinct object positions, um, but not but but no dative. Um, differential object marking overlap. So in 5a we have something like I adverb well, then book and read. So we have um, the object book following the adverb. And this means something like I enjoyed book reading. So we get a non-specific reading of book. Um, this means something like there were multiple reading events and it doesn't have to be the same book that's involved in there. Um, however, when we, when we keep that word order, so when we have an object following the adverb and then add an accusative suffix, um, we get a specific reading of book. So we get something like, I enjoyed reading a book, and this is about a single book. Now we can further sort of modify this example by 
having the direct object precede that adverb, so we're looking at a different position there, and now we only get the specific reading. So with, with or without differential object marking. So this language allows, has different object positions as well. Um, the higher position is sort of uh, associated with a more prominent meaning in that it's um, specific. But this doesn't mean that, it, that they're expressed in the same way as dative. So I'm, I haven't shown you an example with a dative there, but the language has a distinct dative suffix. So basically, those higher object positions are not something that, are, that we only find in this um, dative differential object marking languages. That's the point here. And languages like German, which don't even have differential object marking, also show different object positions and so on. So that's, yeah, that's the point about object positions. Um, uh, the next point we can look at to see what kind of grammatical relations we're dealing with or how these grammatical relations behave is passivization. So in six on page four, we have the passive counterparts to the active sentences in one. So 6a is El libro fue visto, the book was seen. Um, in 6b we have la mujer fue vista. Both of these are theme passives. So we passivize a direct object, a theme or a patient, it becomes the subject. Um, and note that this happens independently of whether the direct object would have triggered differential object marking or not. So it happens with the inanimate and, and it also happens with the animate object. But 6c shows that um, Spanish doesn't allow passivizing a recipient. So we can't say la mujer fue, vista, uh, la mujer fue dada el libro um, with, with the intended meaning the woman was given the book. So we have this test here which shows us that, yeah, we can passivize um, direct objects in Spanish, but we can't passivize indirect objects. Um, turning to Hindi, we can, we can look for the same things. Uh, in 7a and b, we have um, first an active sentence in 7a, Ram will carry Anil, and 7b shows that the direct object can be passivized. We can, have, um, we can get Anil will be carried by Ram, straightforward. In 8a, we have an active ditransitive sen sentence, um, Ram sent Anil the necklace, and 8b and c show that um, this structure can be passivized in both ways, with the dative in the first position or the, um, or the absolutive in the first position. Uh, Mohanan suggests that in 8b the dative is actually the subject, but what's crucial is that the, the recipient retains its dative case here, whereas um, as we've seen in 7b, um, themes don't retain their accusative. So again, even though the, the core suffix is homophonous for both, for both um, types of objects, um, they behave distinctly in passivization. Moving on to page five, there is, a, there is possibly a, a slight uh, complication here in Hindi because some, some speakers of Hindi at least allow retaining an accusative under passivization. So nine shows that um, according to Mohanan, we can say something like Anil accusative was carried by Ram. Um, so, so a passive direct object does not necessarily become um, nominative, it seems. Now, Rajesh Bhatt told me that, at least for him, there's a difference in meaning between, between the accusative preserving and the non-accusative preserving types here. So in 10a and b, we have, a, uh, we have the same lexical material, Ram in earthquake was killed, so Ram was killed in an earthquake. But um, Rajesh Bhatt um, told me that um, when the accusative is present on the, on the subject, for him there's a more active reading here. So while 10a means Ram was killed in an earthquake, 10b means something like Ram was murdered in an earthquake. So there is a, or during an earthquake actually, there is a difference in meaning here with respect to how, um, how agentive the thing is. The crucial point is that, that for indirect objects, that doesn't seem to be this possibility. So direct objects can lose their accusative and often do lose their accusative. And for some speakers, that's the only possibility. Um, whereas indirect objects always retain their dative. And this is, so we basically see identical things in Spanish and Hindi here, that um, direct objects, whether they trigger differential object marking or not, they can become nominative subjects, whereas indirect objects in these languages cannot do that. The next test we can look at um, refers to reduced relative clauses, which actually also involves um, a kind of passivization. And the structures I'm thinking of here are uh, shown in 11a and b uh, with English examples. So something like um, 11a, the book given to the woman, where we have a reduced relative clause headed by a theme, the book. Um, or 11b, 
where we have a reduced relative clause headed by a recipient, so the woman given the book. In English, both of these are possible and perfectly natural. But not both of these, so we don't find both of these structures in, in Spanish and Hindi. So um, in 12 A and B, we see sort of by now familiar examples. We have el libro visto en la calle, um, the book seen in the street, that's fine. We can also say la mujer vista en la calle, the woman seen in the street, also fine. So again, independently of whether we have, whether we would have differential object marking or not, um, these, these noun phrases can head reduced relatives. 13a shows that we can't do this with the recipient. We can't say la mujer dada el libro, um, the woman given the book, that's, that's not ungrammatical. And 13b just shows that, it's not, that this is not something about ditransitives we, because we can, do the, we, can, we can have a reduced relative headed by the theme. So we can say el libro dado a la mujer. So it's not about ditransitives, it's about um, relativizing the recipient. Hindi now shows the same picture as, as Spanish. So now the recipient just sort of, or the indirect object um, patterns, just like in, in Spanish in that, in 14a and b, we can say something like uh, the woman seen in the market. Um, so we can have a reduced relative headed by theme. In 14b, we can have the book given to the woman. So we can also have a, a ditransitive reduced relative headed by theme, that's fine. But in 14c, just like in Spanish, we can't have something like book given to the woman. So the woman given the book is out in Hindi as well. So looking at reduced relatives, we again see that direct objects seem to form a natural class, whether they're animate or inanimate, specific or non-specific, to the exclusion of indirect objects. Um, the next thing we can look at is controlling secondary predicates. Again, I'm giving some English examples to to illustrate uh, what this should be about. So in 15a, we have um, a sentence, I have seen you drunk. And as is sort of often said in, in such transitive uh, sentences, the subject or the object can control the depictive secondary predicate. So in I have seen you drunk, um, drunk can refer to both the subject I or the object you. Context will help you disambiguate what's, what's going on here. But looking at ditransitive constructions, this is, um, this is something that is much more difficult for the, for the indirect object. So in 15b, we have, I have given the book to the woman drunk. Um, and here, drunk wants to refer to the subject. The book will not be drunk, um, anyway. And in 15c, with the, um, with the double object construction in English, I have given the woman the book drunk. I think it's still sort of more, um, much more salient to have drunk refer to the subject. So we can look at this um, in other languages as well. So on the top of page seven in 16, we have examples from Spanish. We can start with something like, uh, with an example with an inanimate direct object. Mi madre compró la lavadora rota. My mother bought the washing machine broken. Um, what's very practical here is that, this, that, is that the depictive uh, secondary predicate in Spanish shows what its controller is because it agrees with it in gender. So, um, so in 16a, it could also be that rota refers to the subject, but that's sort of an irrelevant meaning here. But in 16b, when we have Juan um, as the subject and Maria as an object, we can tell by the agreement on the depicted pre predicate um, what its controller is. So 16b and 16c are a nice little pair because we see a very similar surface string, but we see that they don't really allow the same pattern. So in 16b, we have the predicate hablar, which takes a, a dative argument, talk to. So in 16b, we get Juan le habló a María borracho, Juan talked to María drunk, Juan being drunk, but we can't have the depictive predicate agreeing with the object. So we can't say Juan le habló a María borracha, that's out. So basically, the dative argument cannot control the um, depictive secondary predicate. In 16c, if we change the predicate from talk to to find, both options become available. So we get Juan le encontró, uh, le encontró a María borracho, referring to Juan, but we can also say um, borracha with the predicate referring to María. So a direct object can control the depictive secondary predicate, an indirect object or a dative object cannot. 16D and E show examples um, with domestic violence and ditransitives, I'm going to skip those. They show the same picture, basically. Um, now, I'm not going to talk, uh, mention Hindi here because I don't have the right kind of data, but, um, but a variety of Basque. So, um, some, some 
uh, dialects of Basque have differential object marking, where the differential object marker is, um, again, homophonous with dative case. So we have an example in 17a, including a, uh, from standard Basque, which has a, um, a dative on, on grandmother, the second um, word in the clause. So we have something like, I have carried the child to the grandmother happy. And the uh, indexation on happy shows that in, in the sentence, I have carried the child to the grandmother happy, it's possible that the subject is happy, that the child is happy, but it can't mean that the grandmother is happy. So again, we see that the recipient or goal argument here cannot, contr cannot control the depictive secondary predicate. In 17b, however, where we have, um, I have seen you happy, and you here is marked with the homophonous um, differential object dative marker, um, the, the secondary predicate can actually control uh, can be controlled by the direct object. So in I have seen you happy, it's possible that you are happy. So once again, um, looking at depictive secondary predicates across languages, sort of, um, well, these two languages um, at least shows that direct objects pattern alike, irrespective of whether they have differential object marking or not, they can control secondary predicates, while indirect objects cannot. For the next couple of examples, I'll, I've, I'll only give um, examples from a single language, but they sort of add to the picture in general. So the first point on page 8 refers to nominalizations in Spanish. Uh, 18a shows a sort of straightforward transitive sentence with differential object marking. So we get something like, uh, el perro capturó a Juan, um, the dog captured Juan. We have an animate um, object, a proper name, so that triggers differential object marking, that's fine. When we nominalize this verb, so we make, uh, out of uh, captured, we make capture, we get something like 18b. La captura de Juan por el perro fue sorprendente. So the, the, the dog's capture of Juan was surprising. So what happens here is that we, as the object of a nominal, sort of of the nominalized version of, of capture, we don't have differential object marking anymore. And 18c shows that, that la captura a Juan is, is ungrammatical. So basically what, what we see is that the a, ah, the differential object marker, changes to the genitive when we're in the nominal domain. Um, we can extend this uh, to ditransitives as well. So in 19a we have a, a verbal ditransitive, Maria le entregó el paquete a Susana. Maria delivered the package to Susana. And what we see here is that we have an, an in, inanimate direct object, so there's no differential object marking on, on, the, on the package. We have a dative marker on Susana because it's marked as the recipient argument. When we nominalize this structure, we get la entrega del paquete a Susana. So we get, again, the direct object being expressed by a genitive in the, in the nominalized construction, but the recipient now retains its a, it retains its dative. So once again, we see that whether, whether an argument triggers differential object marking or not, when it's the object of a verb, um, so this, this, this distinction is neutralized when we look at a nominalization, and in the nominalization it becomes a genitive, irrespective of the animacy, specificity of, of the object. However, when we're looking at um, recipients or, or goals which are marked with a, this a is retained in the nominalization. So it looks like we're sort of, we again see direct objects patterning together, indirect objects patterning a different way. The next example is, um, is from a southern Italian variety uh, called Palizzese, which, uh, which also has differential object marking, so animate and definite objects have to, have to be marked with A. Now, we don't see this A so much on its own in these examples uh, because it, it confused with the definite determiner U, giving rise to O. So, um, so in 20A, we have something like, I saw the book, no differential marking, just a, a definite determiner. In 20B, we get, I saw or child, which indicates that differential object marking has happened here. Um, and if we turn the page to uh, page 9, in 21 we see that um, we can have, we can get this or as well in, in a ditransitive construction. So I, we have something like, I gave the money to the child and to the child is or child, just like in the, in the direct object version. However, what's, what's very cool about this variety is that um, its dative has a genitive allomorph, um, which um, should be Greek influence, if I remember correctly, and this is also called the, the, the Greek dative, basically, that you can express a dative case using a genitive allomorph. So this is shown in 22, 
which is just like 21, but rather than expressing the, the recipient with dative case, there's, you can also use genitive here. Now, what the cool thing is that this genitive Alamov only targets recipients, but it doesn't target direct objects. So um, 22b, where we'd have the genitive Alamov for the direct object, is ungrammatical. That's just not possible. So again, we see that now we have sort of allomorphy, which targets indirect objects or recipients, but not direct objects or themes. Um, Spanish clitic doubling. In some varieties of Spanish, we see clitics which are sensitive to the, to the case of the, of the argument, so we can have distinct dative and accusative uh, clitics. Other varieties don't have that distinction, so sort of, um, this is not a very strong argument. Um, but yeah, not bad to mention this. Um, a final point that is, that is interesting to make, I think, is, uh, comes from Kashmiri now, which, um, which also has differential object marking, which is homophonous with date of case. And one thing that's particularly interesting uh, in this language is, is, the, is the case on pronominals, on pronoun objects. Because um, Direct objects which are personal pronouns are only marked with dative case when their person is, is more prominent than the person of the subject. So if you think of a prominent scale where first person is higher than second person, which is higher than third person, then when you have a first person subject and a second person object, you get um, nominative on the, on the pronoun object. But if you have a third person subject and a second person object, then the second person object is more prominent and you get dative. Um, examples show this a bit more clearly. So in 24A and B, we have I am teaching you versus he is teaching you. So the only thing that changes in these examples is the person of the subject. We have a first person in 24A and a third person in 24B. And correlating with this change in person, we see a change in the case of the object. So in I am teaching you, the um, the object you is expressed in its nominative form, whereas in um, he is teaching you, the object is expressed in its, in its dative or differential object marking form. Now, crucially, this, this, this thing only applies to direct objects. When we have indirect objects, they are always dative, and the person of, neither the person of the subject nor the person of the object influences this dative in any case. So in 25A, we have he will hand you over to me, where he is is third person, so it's like the least prominent um, possible person with respect to this, um, this case marking alternation. And um, the direct object U is marked um, dative or in its differential object marking form, and so is the indirect uh, res uh, object me, both are dative. In 25B, when the subject is the most prominent, I am handing him over to you, more prominent than both the direct object and the indirect object. The direct object is nominative, morphologically unmarked, whereas the indirect object is dative. So indirect objects keep their dative irrespectively of the person of the other arguments. Um, 26 just shows that this, this alternation is only, uh, is only found in the imperfective aspect. So in the perfective, we don't get this, we don't get this alternation on direct objects, but indirect objects are still dative. Okay, that was a whole load of data, basically what, what, what we've seen here is that looking at passives in Spanish and Hindi, reduced relatives in Spanish and Hindi, um, depictive secondary predicates in Spanish and Basque, as well as nominalizations and, and some other patterns, these things sort of converge um, on one point, showing that direct objects, whether they trigger differential marking or not, um, behave as a natural class with respect to these uh, with respect to these constructions, whereas indirect objects always pattern in a different way. So I think that these these data are sort of fairly clear for these languages. So I now want to briefly talk about um, uh, English and Hanti to illustrate how how in some languages it is possible to to express themes and recipients as the same grammatical relation. So this is a, a kind of counterpoint to what we've seen so far, because both English and, um, and Hanti allow, um, in a fairly straightforward way, to show that themes and recipients can be the same grammatical relation, so that they pass all of these tests in the same way, or uh, in the same way, but sort of differently than Spanish, um, Hindi, etc. So the main idea here is that um, that 
it's well known that English has a, has a ditransitive alternation for some verbs, including give. So we can have, uh, uh, in English, give can have, or can appear with what is often called the prepositional dative construction, something like, I gave the book to Mary, where the recipient is expressed with, with, with to. Um, or we can have the double object construction, uh, double object construction, I gave Mary the book. Um, a lot has been written about this. Um, there's some references here on, on page 11. And um, one way of thinking about this is, is illustrated in 27 and 28. And you don't have to take these, um, these structures too seriously. They're sort of more, more there to illustrate um, uh, a, a crucial property of both constructions. So in, in 27, we have what I call the recipient prominent structure. So in some sense, the recipient is more prominent. The recipient gets accusative. Um, in some languages, the recipient will agree with the verb, and so on. We'll see examples of all of this. In a theme prominent structure, um, it's the theme that is accusative, the theme that can agree with the verb, um, and, and also arguably in a higher position than, than the recipient, maybe. So in languages which allow both of these, um, we, get some more, uh, we get some more freedom than in, in, in Spanish and Hindi with respect to some of the tests we've seen. So, in 29, we have um, two ditransitive examples from English. I just mentioned that we can have, I gave the books to Mary, or I gave Mary the books, straightforward. Now, both of these allow passivization, but in both of these, we can only passivize the, the more prominent argument in the sense of 27, 28. So, I gave the books to Mary allows the structure the books were given to Mary, and we can kind of tell that we passivize the prepositional dative construction because the recipient still has its prepositional dative. Um, whereas the books has become the subject here. So that's 30A. Um, in 30B, in Mary was given the books, we can sort of see that we passivize the double object construction because there's no, um, so this, this, could, this can originate from I gave Mary the books. So English allows both, both theme and recipient passives, and this is in contrast to what we've seen before. English, and we've seen an example of this earlier, also allows both constructions and reduced relatives. So we can have the books given to the woman or the woman given the books. Straightforward. Now, English doesn't really, um, might not tell us that much more, um, but uh, Hanti gives us some interesting other data, or actually shows some, parallel, uh, some parallels, but also shows object agreement. So uh, Hanti is a Uralic language. Um, its sister language, Manchi, behaves in the very same way. Um, and both of these languages are similar to English in that certain predicates um, have ditransitive alternations. So like English allows a prepositional data and a double object construction, um, Hanti and Manchi allow so-called indirective and secundative um, alignment. These terms basically mean that one of, the, one of the two arguments in a ditransitive can become accusative, and the other argument is an oblique. So, um, examples of this are shown in 31, uh, 32 A and B. In 32 A, we have a theme object which is, which is accusative and a recipient which is expressed as a, as a postpositional phrase. So, we, gave, we have something like, I gave, I gave, uh, sorry, I cup to Peter gave. Um, and the two verb forms show that we can either have, uh, we can, we can, uh, the verb can agree with the, with the accusative object um, but the verb doesn't have to agree with the accusative object. Both are fine. Now, the same verb allows a different um, argument structure frame in 32b. We can also say, um, I, now Peter, the recipient is in accusative, the cup, the theme is in locative case, and the verb now must agree with the accusative object. So we have basically an alternation like, I gave um, a cup to Peter, and then something like, I provided Peter with a cup, basically. So two ways of expressing transfer of possession using different cases on the theme and the recipient. The crucial point now is that um, Hanti differs from Spanish and Hindi and so on in that what is accusative here really seems to be the same kind of grammatical relation because the accusative object can undergo all kinds of syntactic processes that the other object cannot. So we, we see in 32 that accusative objects, whether they're themes or recipients, can agree with the verb. That's fine. Um, accusative objects can also be in a, sort of, uh, in, a, in a high syntactic position outside of the VP. 
And this is shown in um, 33A and B, where we have in 33A, a uh, teacup accusative preceding, um, so where did you take the cup? Where well, we have teacup preceding the, the question word where, or in 33B, uh, where we have um, this, I gave the cup to Peter, and, and again, cup uh, preceding the recipient. Um, what they also have in common, both theme res uh, accusative themes and accusative recipients, is that both can be passivized, just like in English. So in 34A and B, uh, we see a theme passive and a recipient passive, respectively. In 34A, we have the girl was given to him. Girl is in the nominative, he is in the dative, just like, just like in English. Um, 34B shows a recipient passive, where we have he was given a knife by John. And here the recipient is now um, nominative, and the and the knife, uh, the knife is oblique in locative case. And um, turning with the page to page 13, we see that, as might not be surprising by now, that reduced relatives are also possible um, in this language headed by both a theme and both a recipient. And again, these, these kind of show nicely which case frame they originate from. So it's always the accusative um, which, which can sort of become the head of the reduced relative, and the other argument stays in its oblique case. So in 35, we have, to the child given book was very expensive. So the book given to the child was very expensive. And we see on child it's marked with lative case, which is the recipient in, um, which marks the recipient in Surgut Um In 35b, we have a reduced uh, relative headed by a recipient, where now we have with the book given child. So the child given the book. Um, here the child is, is the recipient, heads the reduced relative, and the other internal argument has its oblique case that it has in this case frame. So basically what English and Hanti both show is that it's possible in, in, in principle to have, to have a case marker that expresses, uh, or to associate a certain case marker with one type of grammatical relation, and in some sense, this is similar to what we see in Spanish, right? Because we have a similar, we can have, we can have the same morphological expression for both themes and recipients. But these data show that these languages differ from Spanish and Hindi, etc. Because whatever has accusative in, in English and Hanti actually can undergo passivization, reduced, uh, reduced relative formation, etc. So we see this difference between these types of languages and English. Uh, sorry, Spanish. Um, but there is a way of kind of forcing Spanish into this, uh, into this pattern as well. Because while not all languages allow different um, case frames with a single predicate, many languages will have different predicates with, which allow different case frames. So I've, I've already mentioned that in English we can say something like, I give the book to the woman, where we have um, an unmarked or an accusative theme, and they prepositional or dative um, recipient, but we can also say, I provide the woman with a book, in which case the recipient is accusative or morphologically unmarked, um, and the theme with a book is now expressed with an oblique prepositional phrase. English is not the only language with predicates like this, of course. Um, so in Spanish, one example of such a verb is armar, to arm, so to provide someone with weapons, which behaves in the same way in that its recipient is is now kind of accusative, and its theme um, is expressed with a, with a preposition. Uh, 37 shows an example, el gobierno armó el ejército con pistolas, the government armed the army with pistols, just like in English. What's interesting about these verbs now is that the, the direct object, if you want to call it that, which uh, we can call it direct object for now, um, is now a recipient rather than a theme. And it's this recipient now which takes part in differential object marking, right? So in 38a, when we have not the army, but we have an animate um, object, we get differential object marking. El gobierno armó a los soldados con pistolas. So we get um, differential object marking on the recipient now. Again, the argument which has accusative or differential object marking can be passivized. So we can get 39, los soldados fueron armados, etc. The soldiers were armed by the government. We can do the other test as well. In 40, we see that um, the recipient, which is the kind of accusative recipient now, can head a reduced relative. So we can say los uh, soldados armados con pistolas. Um, we can also see that the recipient argument, um, the recipient argument's case now changes to genitive and a nominalization to the degree, degree that this is 
acceptable, so we can say el armamiento del ejército de los soldados. Um, and we can also see that the recipient can now control uh, a depictive secondary predicate when it's introduced by a verb like this. So in 42, we get el capitán armó a María borracha, the captain armed Mary, and Mary was drunk. Um, and, and in 42b, we see that that meaning is not possible when we express it sort of in the ditransitive construction with, with give, with the similar meaning. So what these examples are supposed to show is that um, what's, uh, what's, what's going on with differential object marking seems to be that um, it, it happens on the, on, the, on the object that the verb takes as its, as its direct object or its primary object, as it's also called sometimes. So it's not about themes and recipients per se. It's about which, um, which object, in Spanish at least, can sort of appear as an, as an unmarked object. Um, and when it's the recipient that it appears as a, as a primary object, so when the recipient um, is in this accusative role, then it can undergo all of these tests that direct objects otherwise can as well. But we've seen that when a recipient is introduced by, by, is, by, the, by a, then it can't do these things. So it looks like the argument structure of the verb also determines w what's going on here, and it's, we can have distinct grammatical relations here. So to, uh, to come to an end, soon. Um, I've talked about tests sort of, of how we can try and distinguish between um, direct or primary objects and, and secondary or indirect objects. What I haven't, I, and I mentioned in the beginning that, that I think that, this, um, that these data are best analyzed um, in the morphological way. So just very briefly, um, on the top of page 15, um, I'm showing how, how such a morphological analysis could work. And the idea here is very simple. So people for a long time have been thinking about uh, decomposing case into, or like, yeah, decomposing case into smaller features and sort of expressing case by, by using sub-features. Um, so for Hindi, for example, we could say that nominative is actually a bundle of two features, which could be minus governed, minus oblique. The labels that, that I'm using here are from the literature. Um, in principle, they can, it, you can use other labels here, and there's also ways of making this a bit more systematic than what I've shown here, but this is just a very simple way of, of looking at it. So nominative is specified by um, minus governed, minus oblique, for example. Accusative um, can be expressed as plus governed, minus oblique. So it differs from nominative in one feature. And we can have a third case, dative, which is um, uh, which is expressed as plus governed plus oblique. So we get um, so we get these three cases, which are which are distinguished by one one feature each. Um, now the only thing on a morphological account that needs to be said in a way is that we have two uh, we have two suffixes that that can be spelled out. We have a zero suffix which is inserted when when a case is specified as minus governed and minus oblique. So whenever we have nominative in the syntax, the morphology sees this and spells out nothing. That's fine. Um, and sort of a common way of modeling syncretism is that you just have some un underspecification in one of the items that you want to spell out. So in 44b, we see that for Hindi, it would be enough to say that core um, is only specified for a plus governed feature, and that's the one that accusative and dative ha have in common. So whether the syntax gives an argument an accusative or a dative, um, doesn't matter for the morphology because the morphology will see, okay, we have plus gov, so we'll put a core in there. But that's just morphology. That sort of doesn't mess with what we see in syntax. And this kind of idea, and there's other ways of implementing this, but this kind of approach can get us the, the sort of different syntactic representations of, of direct objects with core and indirect objects with core. Um, sort of, yeah, different syntactic representation of those two, those two things, but the same morphological spell out. Um, so that's, that's the idea behind how, how you can do the syncretism. So what I tried to show is that syntax sees the differences between differential object marking objects and dative objects in Spanish and Hindi and Basque and Kashmiri. If, if, objects, with, with and, uh, if objects with differential object marking and indirect objects are syntactically identical, so if they were the same grammatical relation, um, we would expect that this grammatical relation sort of shows consistent behavior, but this is not what we seem to find in these languages. Um, 
And I suggested that this, this distinct um, syntactic behavior can be captured by saying, okay, in syntax, these are different things. We have what we assume for other languages as well. We have direct objects and indirect objects, but they happen to be spelled out in the same way. Um, on this view, whatever differential object marking really is, it's sort of, I've been treating it as an allomorph of accusative, right? So in, in, in Hindi and Spanish, say, um, sometimes the direct object has accusative case which is null and sometimes it has accusative case which is a or co respectively. Um, and I think that sort of some support for this idea comes from, from languages in which, we, in which we know that we can express themes and recipients as the same grammatical relation, like English and Hanti, and these languages show, dif show different behavior from Spanish, Hindi and Kashmiri and so on. So I think um, we can sort of put those languages to one side and say that languages in which differential object marking and dative show homophony can be explained in a morphological way because we see the distinct syntactic behavior. And that's it. Thank you. Example 37, when you discussed 37, you were hesitating what to call the army. Yeah, yeah. Primary object or yeah. direct object or privileged object. Does that matter for you? Um, it's, it, it only matters to the degree, I think, that um, I, I would say that... So basically, I think for cross-linguistic... Um, uh, What's the word? I don't know. It, it makes sense maybe from a terminological point of view to say direct object is um, a theme object that is marked identically in a, in a transitive and a, and a monotransitive and a ditransitive. And the primary object is, is one that is marked identically in a monotransitive, a recipient that is marked identically in the... Um, that is marked like, a, like an unmarked monotransitive object. So like the classical definition of those terms. Um, what I'd have to say for Spanish then is that primary objects and direct objects behave alike, and indirect objects and secondary objects don't. So basically, there could be a way of just saying that having a primary or a direct object is one grammatical relation, and then there's a secondary object relation, which... So it's, it, I think it's a terminological point of view. Mm -hmm. I was hesitating a bit because I hadn't, I hadn't introduced primary objects, so mm -hmm. I wasn't sure whether it would be confusing or not mm -hmm. to do that. So I think, yeah, it's, a, it's not a very deep issue, I think. Um, the, the idea would be that primary and direct objects behave like. Yeah. I've got a small, maybe, related question. Mm -hmm. What would you call non-agreeing <coughs> object in Hunter? Mm -hmm. um, in 32A, for example. Yeah. Um, 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 yeah, that's a, that, that's a good question. <coughs> I'm, so given that... Uh, given that, that a non-agreeing object can also passivize, right? Mm -hmm. Or can it not? Okay, yeah. Well, then, yeah, then, it's, then it's different from the, from the relation that, that triggers agreement, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I'm not sure whether we'd have to introduce like a, another, another object. So what, what, what you do in the, in well, the book is... We called it object two. Yeah. Uh, it's restricted to a theme patient theory role, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, uh, so the, the non agreeing object in Hunty would be, uh, yeah, could be one that is restricted to a theta role, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that sort of mm, doesn't make it quite clear what a secondary object would then be, maybe. Something like in, in 32B, the relative kind. Well, basically, I think we said that it's a language with differential object marking, but without the double object construction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions, perhaps. Um, 
Uh, one is, I suppose, a, a bigger question as to how you, or if you can, under your account, account for how this variation arises mm -hmm. so cross linguistically. Um, so you have your kind of structures here, but also like why that would, or how that would become the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then another, perhaps related or perhaps completely separate question in terms of the kind of more like information structure and why. So you mentioned with the earthquake example, I think in Spanish, mm -hmm. a sort of subtlety in like mm -hmm. um, interpretation. I think again, even with the Fanti one, where you have like, I provided Peter with a cup, perhaps being slightly distinct from give and something. So I wondered if you could expand on yeah. that. So the, the, the provided translation was just there to, to show a similar like, case frame in English, rather than I give Peter the cup, which doesn't have, which sort of where both arguments are unmarked, in provided the theme has a preposition. So I provided just, sort of to have a parallel in the, in the marking. The, so, the, in, so in Hanti, as far as I remember from, from the literature, it's, uh, it, the, it is the information structure with, which influences which, which object you have um, in the accusative, basically. Um, that seems to be a perfectly, I mean, I'm very happy with that being an explanation, right? I haven't really looked into what, um, I, I think for English, some people have tried to come up with uh, all kinds of uh, explanatory variables for when you use a different uh, when you use the prepositional dative construction and double object construction, and there are some restrictions on the animacy of the recipient, for example. So um, you can say things like uh, I gave uh, I gave Mary the book, or I sent Mary the book, but you can't say I sent London the letter, things like that. So so these things play a role, but I think that these things uh, will probably have show some differences across languages. So I, um, yeah. When it comes to when it comes to something like uh, using the verb to arm instead of give arms to or give weapons to, I can imagine that that's also something where you know information structure influences whether you say whether you kind of want to keep continuity with the recipient or whether you in a context where you're more it's more about you know different kinds of weapons or whatever you use the weapons as the theme. So I think that um, whatever <coughs> seems to be maybe more salient, more topical. I could imagine that there's a trend to expressing that as, as morphologically unmarked or accusative, basically. Um, with, the, with the earthquake example, uh, the, that's, yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting phenomenon that I didn't look too much into. I have, so, um, so with Hindi, the, so Mohanan writes that some speakers, so some varieties of Hindi seem to allow this, uh, this alternation of retaining accusative. Um, Rajesh Bhatt told me that he thinks that sort of all speakers have this, which is a contradiction. So I, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I think it's more about the writers, maybe. I do reference um, the Turkic language Sakha there, which seems to have a similar thing that in accusatives it can, um, in passives it can retain accusative, and there it's also said that there's something agentive about it. So I haven't really looked into where that's coming from, but I think it's it's about. The, something about the representation of the argument structure in the, in the passive. So there, passive is mostly about reducing transitivity rather than sort of removing the agent, and that gives us some differences. Was that what yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay, <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for a great talk. I never really know if this is like an appropriate question for these kind of talks, but you've drawn on a number of languages yeah. I was wondering uh, why you chose these ones in particular and how generalizable you think this phenomenon is. <laughs> it's, it's a thing that you have to look at for each language in a way because um, uh, because yeah b because we find similar overlaps right so English gives you a way of expressing themes and recipients with the same with homophonous marking in a way so does Spanish but when you look at different tests they show different results so you kind of have to have to do this I think for different languages. Um, English is handy because it's, uh, it's widely spoken by this audience, for example, um, and, uh, and gives this, and has this nice that transitive alternation that is sort of well known. Um, uh, Hanti is in there because that's sort of uh, where I found a lot of this, sort of the similar behavior of, of recipients and themes, um, and there's some accessible literature. Um, Spanish is, uh, is one of the sort of prime examples of a language of differential object marking. And in, in general, so the, some of the papers that I referred to in the beginning, uh, where people have suggested that, that direct and indirect objects are 
maybe express the same syntactic category, they were dealing with Spanish in part and other Romance languages. So, uh, so that's it. I would like to have uh, some more non-Indo-European languages with, with the same overlap. And I'm pretty sure that they're around. Um, so Basque is an example, but with Basque, it's sort of difficult to rule out that Spanish could have had an influence on that. So, uh, yeah, I'd, sort of, I'd like some more examples which, uh, which are unrelated to the ones I have. Ideally, if someone knows of a language like that, I, what would be a good contrast is another language which doesn't have differential object marking but has dative and accusative syncretism because that would also show that you, know, you can have syncretism of these two cases, which I'm sure also exists. It's just not, not, not a part of differential <laughs> object marking because that would give us another, another piece of evidence that there's nothing inherent about that kind of homophony that is linked to differential object marking. There are many languages where um, recipients have to be mapped as direct objects <laughs> and not differential object marking. Can mm -hmm. give you references yeah. later? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it was um, practicality um, to some degree. Yeah. Okay. And Michael Silverstein published a paper many, many years ago in which he uh, draws a linkage between what he calls nominatives and datives mm -hmm. and um, essentially arguing from a, a very wide range of languages that when you get um, constructions in which differential object marking is collapses, mm -hmm. that the encoding is always in a dative case structure. Um, mm -hmm. So if a language, for example, has um, differential object marking in main clauses, mm -hmm. but then in dependent clauses it, it, it doesn't make that distinction, then the encoding is typically dative. Okay. Of the of the subject then, or, or no, of the object then. Yeah. Okay. Do you know which paper of his that is? Um, I'll I'll have a look. Nine nine to the dative from the or something like that. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. I wasn't aware of that. It was actually written in about 1974, <coughs> but it was it was published in the 90s. Uh, okay. In a volume edited by. Uh, okay. Thank you. And you get the same thing in anti-passive construction. So mm -hmm. languages that have differential object marking in ordinary basic transitive clauses, mm -hmm. when you form anti-passives, they typically encode. They collapse the distinction and encode all of what would be objects as datives. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I'll have a look. Thank you. Which doesn't, that's not what you get with indirect objects. Yeah, I think I have to look at those structures to, um, to understand what's going on there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. My earlier question was this, like how it also yeah. links to how this, how do you account for this variation, like how it arises oh. in... Yeah, which variation? Um, so why, why, why English has different gives and, and other languages don't? Or, 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 or the other way around, yeah. or all yeah. of the above, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Good question. Um, so I think one what some people who have looked at give a lot, <laughs> probably Martin Husband might have um, has said is that when you, if I remember this correctly, sort of a certain kind of more prototypical ditransitive verbs, and sort of give is the most prototypical one I think. And I I seem to have a vague recollection that sort of if you have these kind of alternations, then they would start with a verb like give. Mm -hmm. So you. Maybe you don't have <coughs> maybe you don't have a language which only has this for send or like throw but not give. So, so this is also something that people have looked at to some degree in, in, in English as well and other languages how how give and send and throw behave uh, with respect <coughs> to whether they allow these alternations. Um, yeah. So maybe maybe it's just it's a kind of extension of often of an information structural mm -hmm. device from one predicate to another. And it starts somewhere, 
and it seems to start with give usually, and then from that it can go somewhere. So, um, and then it could, do, yeah, spread out. As exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think, and there there seem to be some scales involved. Yeah. So in this the, in this ten thousand uh, two thousand ten book by uh, Malchikov, Hasbrouck, and Comrie on transitive constructions, and they have this analysis. I think of. Um, uh, s in terms of semantic maps, where they show how 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 certain meanings in that transitives can spread out from give to other predicates, and they show that in different languages. So there seems to be some regularity in how these things happen, <coughs> which I can't remember. But yeah, um, there is something there. <coughs> but give is useful because it's it's very it's very common <coughs> and it's easy to handle in many languages. Can I, ask, no, Hannah was asking after the pragmatics, can I ask after the semantics in the Spanish case, what is differentially marked are animals? Yeah, that's a, that's a, um, that's uh, a difficult question. So animacy plays a role, um, but you can also have differentially marked inanimates. I think then they have to be definite. Um, and having looked at sort of some of the lit literature, I mean, I think it's difficult to look at all the literature on Spanish differential object marking. No two people completely agree on what triggers. Uh, I think one part is also uh, one aspect of this is also that um, different varieties of Spanish handle these things in different ways. So, uh, in general, anim animacy and, and, and definiteness, uh, animacy and specificity play a role. Mm. Um, but there's some ways of, of overriding it. So, yeah. Um, do you, do you know about other languages? I mean, is there, what, what are the semantic factors in... You know? uh, that's actually, yeah, that's, that, that's, um, that's a good point. So when I started thinking about this, I was actually more on the side of, uh, of thinking that maybe, they, maybe the two R's and cores and so on are actually the same thing, because <coughs> these languages seem to involve, um, these languages seem to involve both animacy and specificity to some degree, and, and recipients are often also animate, right? But it can't be that simple because we've seen that um, in, in, in two we have an indefinite, uh, we have a definite but inanimate recipient or goal argument in Spanish which also takes an R. So, mm -hmm. so these are maximally tendencies. Um, so, in, so, but animacy might play a role in many languages. In Persian, which has differential object marking, where the differential object marker uh, originates from what used to be a dative suffix, if I remember correctly, their animacy doesn't play a role. So it's also not that this, this dative connection is necessarily tied to animacy. It mm. just happens to be the case in many languages, <coughs> I think. But, but yeah, um, actually, a, another good language to, to find would be one which has differential object marking where animacy doesn't play any role, but still has the homophony, because that would sort of... Um, but still has what? Sorry? But still has what? Uh, still has differential object marking yeah. and the homophony between data yes. and yeah, mm -hmm. because then that eliminates another variable. So mm -hmm. it would give us another control case mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now in Bantu, yeah, <laughs> 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 go for it. Um, sometimes people compare this with with object marking, mm -hmm. optionality, mm -hmm. obligatoriness. So in Swahili, there's an object marking paradigm, and you have to double the object if the object is animate. Um, but then there's, there's variation across Bantu languages where, so this looks like a semantic clan, and that's fairly robust, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you have similar effects where it seems to be morph morphological terrain. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in Makua, the language Nick has worked on, mm -hmm. that seems to be a, a noun class. <coughs> yeah. um, and then in Chaga, it seems to be pronouns. Mm -hmm. So whether that's a morphological thing or a pragmatic thing, uh, you know, nobody knows really. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it seems to me that and, and this might, you know, that in, in a sense, it goes what you say about the tendencies. I think it looks a bit like, you know, people want to mark a particular, I think, semantic relation, probably, but it's a bit vague. But then they piggyback on formal mm. means which are already there. Yeah. So that's why you get the, the data. So in a sense, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's a useful thing that data is also recipients of an animate, but actually that might not be. But it's just the formal means are there. And you mm. want, you know, there's a need or you know, desire yeah. to express a particular semantic relation. So in this case, you, you piggyback on the on the, on the data marking. In the Bantu case, you just piggyback on the on the on the object doubling because there isn't really a case distinction. Mm -hmm. So we don't have yeah. that. 
Um, but in the, and from that perspective, the system would be exactly identical. It doesn't matter what the formal means is. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is the sort of secondary use of established grammatical expressions. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. you know, in, in the, from a, you know, if, if you think of a grammatization story, you would at some stage expect that that's then the primary drive. And then you get things like what you have in German, where you have remnant type things like certain predicates take particular cases, like, yeah. you know, this help with dative and think of as a genitive, mm -hmm. which are really weird. But, but in a sense, these are historical remnants for something when it was maybe more motivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, that's another good point, the, 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 the piggybacking story, actually. And, and what I haven't really mentioned is, is why it would be the dative and the, and the differential marker that would be secretive, right? So um, there's, some, there's, there's, some, there's a paper by Georg Bosson who sort of coined the term differential object marking, and he, he wrote a lot about this. And he made some counts, I think, and he said that when there is some syncretism of the differential marker with another case, it tends to be the, so the dative is the more, most frequent alternative. So we can actually ask why that would be. Um, and I think that sort of what might actually help is syncretism accounts in some senses that, that dative and accusative are sort of close together on, on people's case hierarchies. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it doesn't have to be the animacy necessarily. It doesn't have to be a formal feature that, that sort of gives that closeness, but it could just be that something about how cases are, so accusative being the, um, being a non-oblique case and dative being the f or like on the boundary between being non-oblique and oblique. So syncretism between accusative and dative seems to be a cost mystic common thing anyway. So it's that kind of piggybacking, I mm. think, yeah. But it doesn't have to be in a certain <coughs> agency or something like that. So, yeah. mm. I can also add that the story we had in the book is basically uh, that in many cases this differential object marking st starts indeed uh, as marking of topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we call them secondary topics, but anyway, mm -hmm. they tend to be recipients. Uh, for, for various mm -hmm. independent mm -hmm. in many cases that's actually a historical source of, the, of this kind of instructions. Uh, then uh, grammaticalization can go different, different ways mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, it can spread to, to, to objects which are not recipients. Sometimes uh, it spreads only to animate objects, specific objects and there are diff 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 different tendencies there. But basically we, we had some kind of story which goes back to the information structure marking. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but mm -hmm. uh, that was the, the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> but, but I think that can be the whole story, though, because we get differential subject marking with, um, and often with dotives as well, right? So, <coughs> South Asian languages yeah. where the experience of mm -hmm. subjects are with dotives. Yeah. Um, so you get that you get that um, a lot. Well, so at least in some languages, when you have dative subjects, you can sort of identify a thematic distinction in the predicate, right? So that that it's not sort of not an it's not an agent that would get a dative, but an experience or something. So so speculating, um, you know, it's possible that 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 a language chooses to, to sort of build on that analogy maybe and, and sort of come up with something like this, that you, you have that distinction at some point where, which, yeah, which would be sort of more what you just said, that, that recipients um, are maybe the first element that shows something and then based on that you sort of go down a certain path. You can imagine that if you have a language which marks experience some subjects with dative, then that can influence uh, grammaticalization of differential subject marking, which maybe loses the distinction or the loses the sensitivity to experiences, but retains the dative marking in something. So, yeah, that's true, though, that then the syncretism doesn't quite work out as nicely because they're close cases. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, so there is a lot yeah. of work by Miriam about, uh, mm -hmm. about grammaticalization yeah. of differential subject marking in <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mm -hmm. Hindi or the other languages. Thank you very much, the next